Uh, the next panel is Josh, Joshua Breitbart from People's uh, Production House and Justin Doy from Blip TV and uh, Matthew Rosenberg, One Blue Brick. Uh, good morning. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for, for holding this hearing on this important issue. Um, as you know, it's a great privilege to testify. Um, my name is Joshua Breitbart. I'm the policy director for People's Production House. Um, as you know, People's Production House provides media education to a wide range of New Yorkers, um, and uh, including actually net neutrality, where for, uh, this year, including net neutra lessons on net neutrality as part of our media literacy courses in public schools. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really seeing that this is a grassroots issue. Um, Tim Carr from Free Press talked about the, the huge response they've gotten to this issue from New Yorkers. Um, we've had uh, many of our community partners uh, so, uh, join us in endorsing this resolution, including good old Lower East Side, uh, New Immigrant Community Empowerment, uh, Families for Freedom, Picture the Homeless. Uh, the Haitian Times, um, as I believe you know, published uh, an op-ed I wrote on uh, this issue. Um, and also, you know, we've seen the growth in attendance uh, for, um, on this issue from 2007. Uh, when um, we were last discussing a resolution along these lines. Uh, it's really not a, a hard sell, um, this issue of all the media policy issues, because it really hits home for the immigrants we work with who use Skype to communicate um, overseas, um, for people that we work with that are just now getting online and putting their content um, up there. And um, the two issues that I really want to, well, the one issue that I really, that I speak to in my testimony uh, that I also spoke to in 2007 is the importance of extending net neutrality protections to wireless networks. Um, I've spoken to this committee many times about why uh, that's important, uh, about um, how, uh, how many people rely on wireless connections and um, how critical it is that we create um, an equivalence across different means of connecting to the internet. Um, and we're seeing progress in that the FCC recon is recognizing that with its uh, proceeding on, um, on this issue um, and would encourage uh, the committee to, to take whatever action it can to um, endorse net neutrality principles applying to wireless networks. Um, what this issue really comes down to uh, is do we see the internet as essential infrastructure or private property? I think that that's really what we saw in uh, the distinction between the first two panels. Um, and I think that, you know, given all the vital services that, that the city is putting online, um, how crucial it is to all businesses, uh, how crucial it is to our democracy, to the functioning of government, it really is essential infrastructure. And, you know, it, at that point, it's really just not, uh, it's not enough for the providers as the, you know, the gentleman from um, the Cable Association said, to simply trust them to, um, to be stewards of this network. Um, the, um, it's a, uh, um, it's essential infrastructure and um, the, so I just want to address some of the things that they said. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, that they, we have these issues and we move on from them, um, you know, I wonder why it was that Comcast denied uh, at first that they were engaging in the, in the uh, network management practices when they were uh, terminating the torrent transmissions. And so much, and the resolutions that are, uh, the regulations that are being considered uh, really are about making the network management practices transparent. And I think that that's really critical um, for, not just for the democracy concerning this essential infrastructure, uh, but also just for um, consumers to compare different services and different network management practices. Um, you know, this is not a situation where uh, we would get into unintended consequences because, in fact, you know, we, our system that we have now is basically a legacy of a net neutrality-like uh, uh, system, and I think that's really important to, to preserve that. Um, you know, the, the companies that are asking us to, to trust their... Um, you know, their best judgment in regulating this essential infrastructure uh, are required to maximize their profit for their shareholders, to maximize the profit of, uh, that they've invested in the infrastructure and to, um, 
leverage that to benefit their content offerings over uh, their competitors' con content offerings. So um, uh, they, the result of having no net neutrality basically uh, encourages them, it's a disincentive for them to uh, invest in new networks because uh, it gives them the opportunity to uh, squeeze penny after penny uh, from their aging infrastructure rather than uh, providing a, an infrastructure that would really be first rate and competitive on a global scale. Um, I'll start the clock late, so I'll end now, and um, you know, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address those. Thank you very much. Um, we've also been joined at the panel by Professor Nicholas Economides, who's at New York University Stern. Thank you very much, Professor. Who would like to go next? Good morning. My name is Justin Day, and I'm a co-founder and CTO of Blip.tv, an internet-based digital media business based here in New York City. We focus on providing hosting and distribution for independent web shows. We started in 2005, and we currently have 20 employees and expect to have 60 employees by 2011. Internet startups are very difficult, especially bandwidth-hungry ones as, such as ours. Nearly half of our existing costs, including employees, go to bandwidth alone. Larger players like Google already enjoy significant advantages due to their economies of scale. Double dipping for edge access could effectively price us out of the market. Even the threat of double dipping introduces uncertainty that makes it difficult for us to budget, us to raise money, or for us to make distribution deals critical for the continued success of our business. As our, as our content competes with television, you know, it, there's a threat that these cable companies or uh, telcos could simply shut us off under the, under the guise of regulating the network. If we, were to make, if we were to start this startup now rather than in 2005, we might decide to focus on international traffic rather than on, on domestic traffic, or we might decide not to start up at all. What we're, not, what we're asking for is not protection. We're just asking for equal access to the internet. We urge your support for this important resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello. Uh, my name is Matthew. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Matthew Rosenberg, and I'm one of the co-founders of One Blue Brick. Uh, we create influencer-driven experiences, and we're proudly a New York-based startup. Um, the issue of net neutrality is a deeply personal issue for me. It affects us not only as builders and creators, but as users of the internet as well. Um, we as a company have experienced firsthand what happens uh, when the carriers insert artificial barriers against us developing new products. Right now we're working on a mobile tool that we're hoping to launch in, November, uh, in December. It utilizes SMS or text messaging. And uh, currently to, to have access to text messaging, you have to go through the carriers. So we're paying to play with the carriers, as well as our users are going to have to pay to be able to send the SMS messages. It's a double charge. Um, and this kind of uh, double charge is something that we would see on the internet if net neutrality, if this kind of law isn't passed. And uh, a small business like ours, just like with Blip TV and many others in the New York-based area, wouldn't be able to, to compete. But I also see this issue as something bigger. Uh, to me, personally, the internet really represents the best of the United States, the best of, of what we as Americans are all about. It's free, it's open, it's democratic, it's equal for, equal for all. And I look at what uh, the resolution today and what they're trying to pass um, in Congress is, is not a law but a set of principles similar to the Declaration of Independence. You know, we'll be setting an example to the rest of the world that the internet is free, that information is free, that knowledge is free, and that people are free. Uh, I think the internet has really changed the world and brought humanity forward, and I hope this kind of law protects it for generations, uh, for future generations, and for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Sorry, I have laryngitis. It sounds awful, but it's not more. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Professor Nicholas Economides. I teach at uh, the Stern School of Business of NYU, and I'm really honored to be part of this uh, panel. Um, I came here to tell you that uh, we need to formalize the net neutrality tradition of the internet by passing strict net neutrality law to protect the public interest. The majority of the Earth's population is connected by a global telecommunications network, the internet. It's the most successful network in human history. Unlike traditional information networks such as newspapers, radio, and TV, the internet is based on interactive telecommunications. It allows, it allows for revolutionary real-time participation of users. 
with almost a billion connected computers and now so deeply embedded in our life, the most surprising aspect of the internet is that it's so new, it's only 16 years old. It has created massive innovation at the edge of the network, where companies and individuals innovated without asking for permission by the network operators, from the network operators. Companies like Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Google, and many others would not exist but for the internet. Old centrally run networks, like if you remember CompuServe, Prodigy, early AOL, which did not allow innovation at the edge of the network, have died or changed to be internet-based. The internet's extraordinary success and innovation, is spared, uh, it, it, the, the innovation it spared, have been based on openness and non-discrimination. Net neutrality means non-discrimination. Content from anyone and of any type will be treated equally by the internet. So why do we see some network operators wanting to kill net neutrality when it resulted in such a successful network with so, many, so much significant impact on economic growth? Because some network operators want to put their interests above the interest of the public. These companies do this for two reasons. First of all, to promote their own traditional telecom and video services that compete, compete with new ones that have been provided over the internet. For example, voice over IP telephony and Skype threaten traditional voice phone service. Video downloads over the internet threaten cable TV video. The second reason that some network operators want to kill the internet is their hope that they will make more money through discrimination by taxing the innovators on the other side of the network. Killing net neutrality is proposed by telecom and cable companies which have very tight control of the access of residential users to the internet. The vast majority of US residential users have only two providers of internet service, a telecom service and a cable TV company. In a truly competitive market, starting discrimination would lead to a loss of market share and profits to rival providers who did not discriminate. But this is an imperfect market. Telecom and cable companies are to profit from discrimination because of limited competition in local internet provision. On the internet, the US has fallen to number 15 in, Broadway, in broadband internet penetration behind many European countries, Canada uh, and Korea, largely because of high prices that US companies have been able to charge for internet connectivity. Without protection of net neutrality, consumers will have fewer choices in content, video, and telephone service. While Google may afford the tax to be charged by telecom and cable companies for preferential treatment, the next Google won't be able to afford the payments that will be demanded by the telecom and cable giants. Small and new companies, as well as individuals and non-profit organizations who, crea who create their own content, will be put in the slow lane that the telecom and cable companies will create for all those who cannot afford to travel the toll road of the information highway. Abolishing net neutrality will be devastating for innovation, choice, and diversity of content on the internet. Users of the internet worldwide will lose. And if internet innovation is hampered in the United States, the rest of the world will not stay still. Vivian Redding, the European Commissioner in charge of media oversight, recently made it clear that the European Union will protect the, neut the neutral internet. Failing to protect non-discrimination on the internet in the US will leave us way behind Europe in the technology innovation race. Fortunately, the, F the Federal Communications Commission recently proposed to formalize the non-discrimination tradition on the internet and preserve net neutrality and its tremendously positive effects on innovation. It is good public policy. It will protect consumers and the public interest and will preserve and enhance the competitive position of the United States in innovation. The proof of its wisdom is a tremendous success uh, in innovation of the internet so far. I urge you to support a strict net neutrality rule on the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Your students must love you. Thank you. <laughs> um, my question uh, to start with would be for um, Mr. Rosenberg and Mr. Day, which is the previous panel said um, that there could be a way of handling things like the NARAL issue, which, as you know, 
uh, provided um, uh, challenges to NARAL getting out their message. So the question I have is, um, do you think that those incidents would be isolated in the future? Do you think that there would be a way to deal with them individually? Or do you think we need a broader instrument as we have discussed in the resolution? In other words, I think the concern of the previous panel is that the resolution is too much of a blunt instrument and that individual incidents as the one that happened with NARAL and there were a couple of others um, are isolated and we don't need to have a blunt instrument to deal with that. So I'm just wondering how you would respond to that. Um, personally, I think that... that and, and would the FCC be able to resolve it? Because, of course, you could go under, perhaps, by the time the FCC resolved whatever incident it was. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? For me personally, I think um, whatever the FCC does, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm simply a guy doing a startup. Um, but I really look forward to the idea of a set of principles that will guide the internet for the future. Something that won't overregulate it, but that will simply protect startups like each of ours and allow future uh, individuals like myself to innovate freely on the internet. Um, I think that anything, if anything, we're seeing the pace of in innovation on the internet and changes happening so rapidly. Um, and uh, every day you're seeing things that are, that are being started that are uh, threats to the cable companies, to the people that are providing that support from, uh, from the cable to your door, that are giving you that access to the internet. So I think that, that there needs to be that uh, equal playing field uh, principle. Um, again, I think the law needs to be open and, and just for everyone, but something that allows that freedom of the internet to be. I, I'm not an expert in, in the law either, um, but I will tell you that we rely on equal access to the and to the edge of the internet in order to make our businesses work. Um, you know, if the cable companies and telcos need to rate shape their customers, uh, as so long as they do that across applications and across, uh, you know, as so long as they do it equally, uh, you know, we'll innovate to catch up. But what we're worried about is a situation where larger companies like Google can pay for better access, thus effectively eliminating us from the whole picture. Uh, Mr. Breitbart, I know there was a discussion earlier about digital divide, something that you care about and I care about, trying to erase the digital divide. So do you have any sense that um, there was a comment that, you know, in, in codifying net neutrality could hurt our chances of eliminating the digital divide. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd also, you know, love to hear what uh, the professor thinks about that as well. I mean, I think the first thing to realize is that, um, you know, we, I, we've, that uh, closing the digital divide is, you know, now widely accepted as an essential priority for this entire country. Um, but without net neutrality, what um, the previous panelists are basically proposing is, is not even the internet, it's more like television. Um, and I don't think that you know, that's really um, you know, what uh, we're talking about when we're all agreeing that we want to extend the internet. As the professor said, the internet is a two-way medium. And it's really, the net neutrality uh, protections are really essential for uh, preserving that aspect of the internet. So um, to the extent that we are promoting policies to uh, extend, you know, essentially universal access to the internet, uh, we need to be talking about an internet that has a, that's a two-way medium, that's a, an even playing field that, has, that uh, has transparency in how it's managed so that there can be entrepreneurs, so that there can be, um, you know, a real exchange of content, that kind of vibrancy. They, um, you know, there is obviously a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, sensitivity around the, the cost issue, um, but it really is about a value proposition, not just a price point. Um, and if you had a, you know, a, a cheap service that was, you know, um, not the, the freedom and uh, abundance of the, of the internet, um, that's not going to be as, as uh, worthwhile to spend one's money on. Um, and that's what we see, you know, and that's, um, uh, you know, again, why it's so important to extend that neutrality uh, protections to uh, wireless networks since um, wireless service is so much uh, um, more widely adopted uh, at this point than uh, landline broadband uh, networks. Um, I'll also say that, you know, they, they tried to, they dropped the, the 350 billion number you know, the FCC said it would be $20 billion to $350 billion, depending on the quality of service. I certainly want everybody to have the top tier of that. 
Um, I don't really see that um, you know, these corporations are uh, saying that they're willing to put in $350 billion worth of private investment. Um, you know, we're fortunate in New York, you know, we're a great city, we're the, we're the prime cable market, and we have Verizon, you know, basically on the hook now to run fiber optic uh, network to every single household in this city. Um, and, and that's great for us, and that's going to be great for some other large cities, but it's not, um, you know, that's, that's, not the, that's not what they're proposing. If we could have a, you know, if they're, if they're promising that level of uh, deployment uh, nationally and willing to sign a franchise agreement or contract for that kind of universal service, um, you know, then, uh, then maybe we could be having a conversation about uh, how their private investment is going to close the digital divide. Professor, just on this issue of digital divide, I was wondering if you could comment. I don't know if you were here earlier, but there's a feeling that the net neutrality uh, codification could limit our, our hope to get rid of digital divide. Well, digital divide is an important issue. Uh, the Internet, as we mentioned, is a, other people mentioned as well, is a revolutionary um, medium. Um, a two-way interactive telecommunications medium which should be available to all and diversity is, um, is a crucial uh, aspect and goal of the internet. So um, I tend to believe that here we're kind of mixing apples and oranges. Uh, I don't see why uh, killing net neutrality in any way is going to promote um, uh, wider access. Uh, I said in my, uh, in my speech, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it one more time, the U.S. has high prices for Internet access. Uh, we, that's why we are number 15 penetration, which is a shame. I mean, the Internet was created here. Uh, it was definitely an American invention, and now we are way behind many countries. Um, most people get ashamed when I say we're behind France. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I, I, won't, I won't go into the French discussion, French fries and so on. Uh, that was a different administration. Um, so, uh, but the bottom line is we want to have lower prices. Th there is concentration at the local level, at the last mile. This concentration allows the providers to have high prices. Uh, it also allows them to try to propose killing net neutrality. We should not really allow them to kill net neutrality. Can we really force them to have lower prices? It's more difficult. But they're, they're not the same, they're not part of the same equation. Um, the other question is, um, again, trying to play both sides here. Do you think that net neutrality uh, rules will consolidate the market, discourage competition, and slow down infrastru inf uh, infrastructure investment, which of course is what we hear constantly. Now, Professor, you certainly addressed that in what you said earlier, well, but that is the, the comment that comes from those that are concerned about it. Well, I have studied uh, competition and monopoly f for some time, and I have participated in many proceedings, uh, uh, some uh, 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 court proceedings, some uh, regulatory proceedings, uh, one of the arguments that you hear from monopolists when everything else fails is to say, if you give us more money, <laughs> we will invest more. I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, this is the last thing you can, you can, people can say. Okay, we're monopolists, too bad, but, you know, if you give us a bit more money, then we're going to invest. Well, who knows if they're going to invest? I mean, they might give it to the shareholders. I don't really know. I, I, nobody can confidently say, even the executives of companies, that if they make more money, they're going to invest the money and not give it to the shareholders as profits. I, 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 don't, I don't think this is a credible argument. Um, do you think that having a stable, well-regulated environment could, in fact, lower transaction costs and, and spur investment, which is obviously what we all want? Having, having rules is crucial. Um, if we don't have rules, we'll end up going to uh, court, fighting antitrust cases. Uh, give, to give you an example, Microsoft was investigated for seven years, and then it took a number of other years for, for the final resolution of the case. It, this is not internet time. You would like to be able to have resolutions quickly, even quicker than, the, than at the FCC. Uh, it's important to have rules so people know how the game is, is, is played. 
if we say, well, let's not pass any rule, but let's see what happens, uh, maybe the next CEO of one of these companies is going to come like Mr. Whitaker and say, I want to kill net neutrality. W we can't really work that way. And the people who invest in these guys here, who might be the next Google, I don't know, but if they are the next Google, well, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't like them to be taxed heavily five years from now or 10 years from now just because we don't have rules. I mean, it would be good for them to know. Yeah, and I would just say that, that again, it's about uh, you know, making sure that we have a clear set of rules and transparency and that it's not a, everything being, you know, being handled um, by, you know, if you want to start your company up, you have to go arbitrate it on a case-by-case -case basis with your, uh, you know, with your cable provider. That, that seems to me like a uh, greatly hinder uh, startups, and you know, that's what we heard from uh, my co-panelists here, from Mr. Wilson on the first panel. Um, you know, and that's you know that's that's the focus really on the on the content side, uh, and um, you know that's really where these protections would uh, foster continued innovation and, and vibrancy. Okay, I want to thank this panel. I hope you are the two new Googles in the future. We knew you when, and thank you all four of you very very much. It was excellent testimony. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.